everybody. Welcome to St. Michael and all the angels. I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we sing this hymn together. To ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit to come over us. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are us pray. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. A reading from the prophet Micah. You, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, you are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. 
Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. The word of the Lord. Open up my eyes, open up my heart, open up my ears so I can listen. Open up my eyes, open up my heart, open up my ears so I can listen. Boy, that your word be upon my Please stand. Our reading this morning is taken from the third chapter of Luke, verses 39 through 45. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. As it turns out, what the angel told me is coming true. I knew it would. I just knew it. I'm going to have a baby, but not too many people believe me about, you know, the angel. They think I'm just a kid making up a story, but it's true, I promise. I don't know how to prove it, but it's true. My parents are ashamed. I think they want to believe me, but you know how people talk in a small town. They think it's best that I go stay with my cousin, Elizabeth, out of town. Elizabeth is like my mom's age, and she's pregnant too. I am anxious about staying with Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah. I am worried they will judge me too, but what choice do I have? When I get to Elizabeth's house, I don't know how it's going to be. Will they welcome me or will they sneer or scoff or lecture? I just don't know. When I knock on their door, Elizabeth answers. She is so excited to see me. She throws her arms around me and kisses me and says blessings over me and get this, she tells me the baby in her womb leaps upon my arrival. She tells me my baby will be special. Elizabeth believes me. Awesome, thank you, Taylor Brooks, for that reading. 
I hope that her reading that g- gives us a sense of the vibe maybe for the scene that's taking place that we're thinking about today. And that's what I want to reflect on um, during our sermon today. And um, I know it's a, it's a powerful story. It's a story many of us know where these two relatives meet, Mary and Elizabeth. But I want to maybe look at it from an angle that maybe we haven't focused on a whole bunch in the past. And that is to think about um, the shame that is lurking in this story in a number of different places. There are aspects of shame throughout this story in a number of ways, and I want to, I want to look at those. As we do, we, we turn to look at the main characters, Mary and Elizabeth. And, you know, there are lots of great things that are taking place in their lives right now. Um, I, one, of the, Scott, one of the articles I read in researching for today's sermon was titled, Miracle Mothers Meet, which just sounded like such a funny title to me. But, but they've got these great miracles that are taking place, but they also have this stress that's all in the background of this thing of what's, where they've been or what's going on now. And I want to pause and really take a, a deep look at that for a moment. If you start by first looking at uh, Mary. So Mary is betrothed, which is a term we don't use now. It's not a concept that we're familiar with in general. But it's this idea that they, were, they had undertaken this legal commitment, Joseph and her had, that they would marry and that they would live together and have a family and do all these things once all the preparations were made, which could be a year or longer than a year in the preparations. And during this time, this, they were already in this legal binding uh, thing, but there was to be no consummation of it um, sexually. Mary's pregnant. So Joseph has this big dilemma that's taking place, as we know, where he knows what the book of Deuteronomy says. He knows that um, adultery would be seen as condemned in this maximum kind of way. But he's also the almost husband of Mary, and he loves her. He doesn't want her to be exposed. And as it says in Matthew 1, he doesn't want her to be subjected to shame. But that's exactly what society would do exactly what the culture would do would be to shame her that she's pregnant outside of um, marriage and it's interesting to think about you know there's so much in this story we don't know what's happening on this but it's interesting that a number of scholars look at this and they say actually mary was probably uh, about the same age as taylor that's or maybe a little bit older who's re- who read our um, that reading just a moment ago and they would say, look, somebody that age in a patriarchal society probably didn't have the autonomy to just say, hey, I'm going to go spend time three months with my aunt or cousin, depending on how we look at it. But so if that's true, then maybe the more likely scenario is that her parents sent her away to either try to delay or maybe even try to do away with all the public shame that was going to come with what was taking place. That's the stress and the situation going on with Mary. So she's got all this shame of the public and and at least hanging over her shoulder as all this is going on. And then we turn to look at the other player in this, Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth is, Mary's young, Elizabeth is old. She's older than people think that she should be bearing a child. Like she's beyond childbearing age, but she's pregnant. But what that means, like great for her, but what that means is for everything up till now, she has been really shamed. Because in that society, um, to be a woman who was barren was a shameful thing. It was something where the culture would focus on them and also imply that something's wrong. Like, what are you doing wrong? What kind of sin are you hiding? What have you done kind of stuff? There's all this kind of shame. So you get things like when you go back and look at to the patriarchal times, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all them, and you go back and you look at Rachel, Rachel gets this place where she's like, you know, either give me children or let me die. That's how much shame and significance and things there were around that. And to give you a further idea of this, one of the um, biblical scholars I read describes it this way. He says, socially, the position of childless women in the Hebrew Bible is ranked among the despised, the poor, the helpless, and the widows and contrasted with a mother who's blessed joyfully and rich in children. She's, she has dealt for ages 
with this this kind of shame that society wants to give her. And I want to say for a second, she's probably very uniquely positioned to minister to Mary because of all the shame and, and things that she's had to deal with for so long. She's probably in a great place to minister to Mary. And actually, that's oftentimes, I think, the way ministry works. God, if we give him our hurts to him, he'll use our hurts in a way where we can minister to others but that's a whole nother sermon we'll do another day. And then all these things I've said so far have to do with the er external part of shame that comes in. But I wonder what kind of voices maybe Mary is experiencing on this day as we think about what she's going through. Because that's also an aspect of shame. You know, the super popular psychologist of our own day, Brene Brown, who um, did her dissertation work on shame and who is an Episcopalian, Um, She talks about shame this way. She says that I define shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. And it goes to that little voice that pops up in our head that wants to say these things to us that, man, you really messed that up, you're not worthy of this, or somehow you're not worthy of love, or somehow you're not worthy of whatever God's goodness is. It's that little voice that wants to say a bunch of crap that we need to dust off and get rid of. And I wonder for Mary, you know, because we we oftentimes want to hold Mary up so high that we don't think she's capable of having some doubts. But you you think about her again, we don't know the things I'm talking about. I'm just giving you some things to maybe ponder and reflect on. But I mean, she's been visited by Gabriel. She's had this angel. So she's seen an angel who spoke to her. So she's got this. And she now knows the Holy Spirit is visitor. She's pregnant and she's not been through any sexual relations, but she's pregnant. She's got all these testimonies in her. But I still wonder if she's got this little voice that's saying, yeah, you're not really worthy of that. You're not really worthy to carry the Lord. Or was that really Gabriel? Or was that some kind of Mediterranean burrito you had that day? Or, you know, or or what, I mean, like, what kind of doubts is she having at that moment? Or what kind of little voice is she hearing that might say things? I think those are the ways we encounter shame, either sometimes coming from the outside or sometimes from that little voice inside of our heads. And I think most of us, all of us, have experienced that. I certainly know I have. I think I've experienced both pretty full on. And it's really hard, um, different phases of this. I think about the external shame, probably the, uh, this wasn't deserved, but probably the most um, significant one I had was about 10 years ago, I was coaching the YMCA um, soccer team for my boys. And I'd been doing it for about three months. And one day I get this call where they said, do not go to practice today. And I'm like, I've been doing it for three months. Like, what is this? And so I call them and and they're like, what's going on? They're like, we're not able to talk about it. You've got to come in. So I had to call the assistant coach and say, you've got to coach him today. And I go in the next morning, first appointment, like eight in the morning. What is going on? And they tell me, well, you failed your um, mid-semester background check. And I go, what? And they, yeah. So, and they, they, next question to me, and I noticed they were kind of looking at me funny when I came in. Their next question to me was, have you spent any time in New Hampshire? And I said, well, I went there once for a leaf tour. You know, we did the tour, you know, all that, looked at all the beautiful leaves. And she's like, well, there's a Robert Johnston with your birthday who is a convicted pedophile and you have failed your background check. And I'm like, well, that's not me. I've only been there on vacation. And they're like, prove it. (laughs) So then I'm like, what what do I do? I mean, thankfully my day job, I'm a lawyer. So I start, I pull up the pleadings. And first of all, I went and read the newspaper articles. Horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. I got the pleadings, but there's no home address. There's no hometown. Of course, there's no social security. It's just his name and his birthday, and it's the same as me. And so I'm, I get what they're going through, and I'm at wit's end. But the whole time, you know, I'm in this misery with this thing. Finally, I called the DA to give you the full story. I called the DA on the case who said, I, I'm not able to speak about it. But he said, if you go to this website, you can, you can look up any fe- anybody that's in a federal prison, you can look up. And he said, you can look him up, and he's in prison. So I printed that out and went right down there. But still, as I came in the next day with my printout, I could still felt like the receptionists and people are looking at me like, oh, that's the guy, you know? <laughs> so you get this sense of what it is to have 
that society doing that kind of thing. And, and a lot of us deal with that kind of shame that comes from all kinds of places. I think a lot of people get shame from their parents. Um, I'm going to ha- hasten to say, not me. They're watching online. Um, <laughs> but a lot of us get uh, shame that if, if our parents didn't deal with shame that they've inherited, this stuff can just keep going. And you can have it experienced through kinds of uh, unmitigated rage or unrealistic expectations or some form of toxic religion that gets given. You know, I've, I've been exposed to that, the, the religion that's all about the externals and the legalism and the pressure and all the kind of stuff that gets into that kind of place. And we can go to the other end, of course, another sermon where you can get into cheap grace. But, this, but all of this stuff can, all of us deal with some kind of level of this, I think. And we could probably tell story after story after story about kinds of shame that we've experienced. And happily, this um, passage we read today is not ultimately about getting us to remember our moments of shame in life. It has a lot more to say. And the truth is we don't know all the circumstances of Mary going to visit Elizabeth and why she went, what she sent, what was she feeling, what was the voice in her, all those kinds of things. But what we do know is as soon as she arrived, she has this amazing experience because of how Elizabeth greets her. She starts, like if she has doubts, the first thing she gets is blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Like she gets that straight up, a blessing. And in that, you know, there are two different roles that Elizabeth plays on this day because Elizabeth starts out with really a prophetic, a prof- she's a prophet in this, at this beginning place because she's saying to Mary, hey, I know you're pregnant she, she's the blessed is the fruit of your womb. Like she's already there. She knows this. And this is long before the days of telephone. And then she's saying, not only that, but she knows the baby she's carrying is special. Cause like she says, the mother of my Lord is part of what she says. So she's got this prophetic voice, but then she goes on to bless. She goes on to bless Mary. And this is the start in the narrative of Luke's gospel that we're reading that just continues to intensify and get more joyful and more pleasure as it, as it, it goes along. And it's the start of a number of blessings that are going to be given to Jesus where you're going to get that are going to be presented with Zechariah and with Simeon and all the different people that are going to go there. But Mary is blessed. And she's blessed for carrying this child. And she gets sort of an immediate I think blessing because she, because this whole thing turns around again on her because she goes from being sort of in a place where she's worried about getting shamed for the child she's carrying to understanding and hearing that she's going to be blessed and honored for generations because of the child that she's carrying. So it's a complete reversal, like in a moment and she gets God's joy given to her. And I think we start to then think about Elizabeth in this thing too, like the older women of this time would have been all about condemning a young woman who got pregnant um, outside of marriage. That would have been sort of the expectation. That's what they would have all formed ranks around. But Elizabeth has been through how many decades of shame and she's in touch with God and she's not about to do that. She's going to welcome and bless and love and her whole reversal, what she does, she welcomes, she blesses Mary, welcomes her into her home. She's probably going to get ostracized at some level from all her neighbors who are going to say, what are you doing bringing in that, that young teenager that's pregnant in your house and all of this? But Elizabeth gives her that love and that blessing and, that, and that really that grace. And in doing that, she is ch- channeling into really the kind of love Jesus is later going to show. When Jesus welcomes and embraces the prostitute and the tax collector and all the sinners that people think he shouldn't have anything to do with. He goes into that kind of place. What we realize is that Elizabeth sees beyond this circumstances to see the reality of God's love taking place in a different fashion. And for us, I think it's a reminder, a moment to ask, you know, the question about where we are on experiencing this kind of shame or or being around others who are living in that place. Because if we get a hold of that kind of love that God has, it'll let us let go of the shame and any kind of hatred and the hurts that go with it. There's refuge in it. 
Um, I've said before, and I'm not embarrassed to say, I, I see a counselor from time to time, and I've got this counselor that I really love, and she's so good about when I, when I talk to her about my whatevers, about just saying, hey, this is a no-judgment zone. And she doesn't say it, but she's really saying, I'm going to love and support you and encourage you with whatever's going on, and you don't need to ever worry about judgment. That's kind of what she says in it. And I think that's exactly what Elizabeth does. Of course, Elizabeth knows she hasn't done anything wrong. But she, and she blesses her, and she goes from that place. And I think that's part of our calling as Christians. I was thinking about this. I don't know if any of you, you guys got this, but a, a number of weeks ago, it was part of our 75th anniversary kind of stuff, we printed up these shirts that have St. Michael's. There were hundreds, hundreds of these given out. I hope you got one. But the back of it um, says... You are loved, no exceptions. And I wonder if we have any hesitation about wearing that. Because it's great in theory. And I wonder how hard it is for us to be, to love the person who's full of things that our society says are shameful and welcome them in and embrace them with that. How hard is that? That's again, that's what Elizabeth gives to Mary today. And she, she knows she hasn't done wrong. But I, I was thinking about this in the last number of weeks, and I was thinking about this moment of going from theory to practice and where we are on it. And the story that I was thinking about on this was the, um, is a shameful story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by saying that it is a shameful story. It is a story that makes me angry and mad. And I wonder if I could do what one of the people did in the story I'm going to tell. But this is just in the last couple months. If you saw the accident that took place in Las Vegas with uh, the receiver for the Las Vegas Raiders um, and how Derek Carr responded to him. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm going to tell the story. This is with the receiver, Henry Ruggs, came from Alabama, who joined the team. And he's, I don't know if he's his rookie year. Somebody know? Is a rookie year? And he's got his fancy new cool Corvette under the influence, takes it up to 156 miles an hour down the road. He rear ends a 20-year-old woman in the car with her dog, kills them both. And you can see the video of him sitting on the side of the road, wailing, crying w over what he's done, and it's, he's just flushed away at all. And all of us look at that and say, that is horrible, terrible, shameful, and he deserves the 30 years he's probably going to get in prison and all the other stuff. But I wonder, do we have any room in that, even though he's done something shameful, to still give him love. Derek Carr, the um, quarterback for the Raiders, is a very outspoken Christian. Talks about what Jesus did in his life and how he lives and all this stuff. That week, they interviewed him, and the reporter asks him about rugs, and this is what he said. He said, I'll always be here for him. That won't change. I'll prove that over the course of time to him. He needs people to love him right now. He's probably feeling a certain type of way about himself right now. He needs to be loved. If no one else will do it, I'll do it. I don't want to do it. But would Jesus call us to do it? And that whole thing about when we live out our faith, how hard is it to simultaneously say that's horrible, terrible, worthy of all this stuff, but God gives you refuge and still goes to that place. And that's what the kind of refuge that Mary got today. I pray all of us have experienced shame. All of us have experienced, if we want, God's refuge and love, mercy, and grace. And I think as we head into this final week of Advent, the call is to drink from that well of love and be ready to share it and get ready to celebrate that kind of love coming into the world on Friday. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you love us in spite of anything we've done, whatever kind of shame we've been through, deserved or undeserved, that you love us and give, you, give us refuge. We pray that you'd help us to imbibe that kind of love and be in a place to share it in the world in ways that are surprising to us, in ways that we cannot even imagine. And we pray that this week you'd help us to prepare to celebrate that love coming into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I invite you to stand. And joining Christians around the world, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church in the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. That the light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning, everyone. Very glad that you've chosen to worship with us today at St. Michael. Please have a seat. If you are new or visiting with us this morning, please know you are very welcome. We'd love to get to know you better. And so I encourage you to stop afterwards, fill out one of our visitor cards, where you can even go online later, stmichael.org, and click the visit button, especially those of you joining us online. Let us know how we can contact you so we can help connect you more deeply to our St. Michael community. Now, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and there are plenty of things going on over the next few days. Christmas sort of pivots and begins tonight. We have our Christmas Lessons and Carol service at 5.30 p.m. tonight in the church upstairs. And you can join us in person or you can stream it live online. And we encourage you to do so. It will be a beautiful way to really switch into that Christmas season. And then, of course, later this week is Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We have plenty of services beginning at 11 a.m. on Christmas Eve, going all the way through to midnight. And then again on Christmas Day. In the paper handouts or those available online, there's a nice big spread of all
all of our Christmas services, and we encourage you to find one that works for you or to stream as many as you'd like. I think we stream five on Christmas Eve, and so there are plenty for everyone. Um, oh, that was supposed to be Bob's section. Sorry, hold on. I was, I have supposed to say something else, too. What was I saying? <laughs> Oh, I remember. Um, it is our 75th anniversary, and so I want to encourage you. We've got 75th anniversary books that you can pre-purchase upstairs in our bookshop. They're going to be gorgeous coffee table books. It would make a great Christmas present. And giving is important at the end of the year. For those of you who are considering year in gifts, those of you who would like to give above even your own pledge, we encourage you to do so because we continue to serve our neighbors in very profound ways. And you can read a bit more of that in our bulletin today. Every year we give away our entire Christmas plate and we will benefit ministries both locally and internationally that are aiding refugees this year. And so we ask that you plan to give generously at Christmas, but also as you are making year end giving plans, we invite you to remember St. Michael so that we can continue to do more when we band together. Now I hand it over to Bob. I was just going to add what Chris said about the services on Christmas Eve. Um, we're doing one, three, and five for contemporary. The one o'clock service is a jazz service. Justin, you want to say something about it? Our bassist, uh, Bach Norwood, who couldn't be with us today because he was under the weather, is putting together in a phenomenal jazz band. So guys that are celebrated... Um, not only in Dallas, but all over the United States, um, put on a very, uh, like, Vince Giraldi, Charlie Brown Christmas type vibe of a jazz service, and it's very, very great. And uh, so you'll want to be there. That'll be in the church at 1 o'clock, um, and uh, Tiffany and I will get to sing with them, so that's going to be fun. Yeah, so, it'll be good. and then we'll be streaming down here at 3 o'clock, and then we'll be in person here at 5 o'clock. They will be in person at 3 o'clock as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not just Sorry a studio about. audience. Yes, that's right. yes. Thank you for that correction, uh -huh. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming out of time at Holy Communion, and uh, everybody's invited to participate in this moment. If you're not baptized or not comfortable receiving, just come forward and cross your arms. We'll know that you want a blessing, and we'd be happy to do that. If you are going to receive, you just put out your hands to receive the consecrated bread. If, once you've received that, you've received fully, but if you want the consecrated wine as well, they'll be on the ends, the child spares, and you can receive by intinction, which means just dip the very corner of the wafer down in it, or you can receive from, from the chalice, in which case if you'd lift the base so that child spare knows when you're receiving it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you send your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. continue in prayer. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Michael and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us Stay our daily bread and forgive us our 
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
standing as you are able, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Love and serve the Lord. <laughs>